In the small town of Sheridan, Colorado, the sun is high in the sky. It's a typical summer day, the air filled with the scent of freshly cut grass and the distant sound of children's laughter. Richard and Diane Poland, Lori's parents, are going about their day, unaware of the nightmare that is about to unfold. Richard, a hardworking man with a love for his family, has taken the day off to paint their house. The sun is beating down, making the task more strenuous than usual. His two children, Lori, who is three years old, and her older brother, who is five, are playing in the front yard. Diane, a loving mother, is inside the house. She occasionally glances out the window, watching her children play. It's a picture-perfect moment, a snapshot of a happy family on a sunny day. The children ask for popsicles, their favorite summer treat. Richard, the doting father, decides to take a break from his work and head inside to fetch the treats. He leaves the children in the front yard. He enters the house and reaches for the fridge, his back turned to the window. It's a moment like any other, a simple act in the middle of an ordinary day. But when he returns, the world as he knows it shatters. Lori is gone. Her pants are left on the sidewalk, a chilling reminder of the nightmare that has just begun. Richard's heart pounds in his chest, his mind racing as he tries to comprehend what just happened. Outside, the world continues to spin, oblivious to the terror that has just struck the Poland family. Richard's frantic calls for Lori echo through the neighborhood. The laughter has faded, replaced by a deafening silence. Diane rushes out, her heart pounding as she takes in the sight of her husband, his face pale, his eyes filled with a terror she has never seen before. The words spill from his lips. Lori is gone. Their little girl, their precious child, has been taken. Introducing Private Internet Access, the world's most transparent VPN provider. With over 30 million downloads, they've become the go-to solution for streaming enthusiasts and anyone looking to protect their privacy. Here's some incredible news. By using the link provided, you can enjoy an exclusive 83% discount on private internet access for just $2.03 a month. You can unlock a world of entertainment. And as a bonus, they'll give you four extra months completely free. Private internet access is available on all major platforms. Stream your favorite content on your preferred device. Your one subscription is capable of protecting an unlimited amount of devices at the same time. The VPN works seamlessly with all major streaming services, unlocking a world of content no matter where you are. And yes, they support peer-to-peer -peer file sharing. Private internet access prioritizes your privacy. They never record or store user data, and their no-logs policy has been proven multiple times in court and verified by a third-party audit from Deloitte. By using private internet access, you can hide your IP address and encrypt your internet connection. Say goodbye to prying eyes. Have commitment issues? Don't. Signing up for private internet access is risk-free. They offer a 30-day money-back guarantee and their dedicated 24-7 customer service team is always ready to assist you. Link for this amazing offer in the description below. Now let's get back to the video. From Lori's perspective, the events were a blur. Lori, a three-year-old girl, was playing innocently in the front yard, her laughter echoing through the quiet neighborhood. Suddenly a car pulls up, an orange sedan. The man inside offers her candy, a lure too sweet for a child to resist. Lori, with the innocence of a three-year-old, steps towards the car, her small hands reaching for the treat. The man seizes the opportunity, snatching Lori and driving away. The car speeds away, weaving through the streets of Sheridan, Colorado before disappearing into the mountains. Lori is confused, scared, but the man driving the car doesn't care. He has a destination in mind, a place where he believes no one will find them. They arrive at an old abandoned outhouse, hidden deep within the woods. This is where Lori's nightmare truly begins. The man forces Lori into the outhouse, a pit of darkness and despair. He abuses her, a horrific act that leaves Lori traumatized and terrified. When he's done, he drops her into the latrine of the outhouse and leaves her there, alone and scared. Lori is left to fend for herself, her small body shivering in the cold, her cries for help echoing in the empty wilderness. The first day in the pit is a blur for Lori. The world she knew, the safety of her home, and the warmth of her parents' love is replaced by the cold, harsh reality of her new surroundings. The pit is dark the only light coming from a small hole above her. 
The pit is her new reality, her new normal, and it's terrifying. The cold is the first thing she notices. It seeps into her bones, making her shiver uncontrollably. She wraps her arms around herself, trying to generate some warmth, but it's a futile effort. The pit is devoid of any comfort, any warmth. Hunger claws at her stomach, a constant reminder of her predicament. She's thirsty, but there's nothing to drink. She's aware of an infection spreading in her legs, caused by the human waste and chemicals in the pit. She can't see them, but she can feel the throbbing pain and the cold numbness creeping up. She tries to keep her legs out of the sludge as much as possible, but the mound she's sitting on is small and unstable. One chance decision saves Lori's life. The thought of her mother, who had just potty trained Lori, echoes in her mind. Her mother had taught her to sit while in a restroom, so Lori obediently follows. Proud of herself for remembering, Lori is unaware of the toxic gases that had accumulated in the upper portion of the latrine. Should she stand, Lori would likely suffocate and fall into the chemical sludge, leading to a tragic and untimely demise. As the hours turn into night, Lori clings to life. She's weak from hunger and thirst. Her body aches from the abuse she's suffered, but she doesn't give up. She's a fighter, a survivor. She clings to the hope that someone will find her, that she'll be rescued from this pit. Lori manages to survive her first day, but the ordeal is far from over. It's a day that will forever be etched in Lori's memory, a stark reminder of the day her life changed forever. The second day in the pit for Lori is another test of survival. The initial shock of her new reality has worn off, replaced by a gnawing hunger and a thirst that makes her throat feel like sandpaper. The pit is cold and damp, the air heavy with the stench of decay. The only light comes from a small hole above her, casting a weak beam that does little to get rid of the darkness. Her small body shivers from the cold, her thin clothes offering little protection. She wraps her arms around herself, trying to conserve as much heat as possible. Her stomach growls and growls, a constant reminder of her hunger. She has no concept of time in the pit, but she knows it's been too long since she last ate. The third day in the pit is another test of endurance for Lori. The darkness is no longer a novelty, but a constant, oppressive presence. The cold is biting, seeping into her bones and making her shiver uncontrollably. The hunger gnaws at her insides, growing stronger and stronger each minute. The silence is deafening, broken only by the distant sound of the forest and her own breathing. She feels the infection in her legs growing, the pain of a constant reminder of her predicament. The filth and chemicals in the pit have caused her legs to turn black, up to her upper thighs. The numbness intensifies with each passing hour. Her mind is starting to play tricks on her. Time seems to stretch and distort. She can't tell if it's day or night, and she's losing track of how long she's been down here. Is it hours? Days? She can't remember. Her thoughts are a jumbled mess, and she's finding it harder and harder to hold onto coherent thoughts. She tries to think of her mother, of her home, but the memories are blurry and distant. She can't remember her mother's face, can't remember the sound of her voice. The only thing she can remember clearly is the feeling of her mother's arms around her, the warmth and safety she felt. But that memory is fading too, slipping away like sand through her fingers. Suddenly, she's jolted out of her thoughts by a sound. It's a faint, distant sound, but it's the first sign of life she's heard since she was thrown into this pit. She strains her ears, trying to make out what it is. It sounds like voices. She's not sure. She calls out, her voice hoarse and weak, but the sound is swallowed by the darkness. The moment Lori is found is a moment of unexpected miracles. A couple of bird watchers, Cynthia and Stephen Gallen, are out for a hike in the mountains. They decide to stop at the Beaver Hook trailhead, remembering the old camper outhouse there. Cynthia needs to use the bathroom, and as she approaches the outhouse, she hears a sound that chills her to the bone. It's a child's cry, echoing from the depths of the latrine pit. What are you doing down there? She yells out, her voice echoing in the confined space. I live here, comes the faint reply. Cynthia peers down the hole, her heart pounding in her chest. 
The dim light reflects in the tearful eyes of a child at the bottom of the pit. The sight is horrifying, the realization even more so. It's Lori, the missing girl from the news. She's alive. Cynthia and Stephen are in shock, but they know they need to act quickly and call the authorities. Firefighters soon arrive at the scene. Once they arrive, one firefighter descends into the pit, locating Lori in the darkness. Despite being trapped for several days without food or water, Lori is still conscious, though her legs are in terrible shape. The firefighter gently lifts her onto his harness and begins the careful ascent. Once they reach the surface, Lori is immediately sent to the hospital, her parents following close behind. The moment of her discovery is a beacon of hope in the midst of a nightmare, a testament to resilience and the power of chance. So, who was the culprit who caused Lori's nightmare? The question hangs in the air, a chilling reminder of the horror that has unfolded. The question comes after a painstaking process of investigation and deduction. Robert Paul Theoret. That's the name that surfaces, a local golf club groundskeeper with no criminal record. The police find him through a combination of eyewitness accounts and careful detective work. An orange sedan, black letters and stripes at the bottom, a license plate number starting with ATV. These details provided by observant neighbors and witnesses lead the police to Robert. But he's not home when they arrive. Instead, they find his mother, a woman who seems as shocked by the accusations as anyone. She paints a picture of her son as a good man, albeit one who had some issues as a teenager. She mentions an accusation of inappropriate touching of a young person, but nothing was proven. She found women's underwear in his room a few years ago, but he said it was a joke. She's trying to make sense of it all, trying to find some reason, some explanation for what her son had been accused of. The police counter her statements. They present the facts. Robert and his car have been identified in three separate incidents, all involving him offering children candies and asking them to take their pants off, including Lori. The room falls silent as the weight of these words sink in. As the investigation continues, the police meticulously piece together the evidence linking Robert to Lori's kidnapping. They have the eyewitness accounts, the description of the car, and the license plate number, but they need more. They need concrete, irrefutable proof that Robert is the man who abducted Lori. They search his home, looking for anything that might tie him to the crime. They find women's underwear in his room, a detail that his mother had mentioned. They also find candy wrappers, similar to the ones Lori had described. It's not much, but it's a start. Meanwhile, Robert's wife is doing anything she can to protect her husband. She provides him with a forged alibi, claiming that he was with her at the time of the kidnapping. But the police are not easily fooled. They cross-check her statement with their timeline of events, and it doesn't add up. Finally, they bring in Lori for identification. Despite her young age and the trauma she's been through, Lori is unwavering. She identifies Robert from a lineup, pointing him out without hesitation. That's him, she says, her voice steady. It's the final piece of the puzzle, the confirmation the police need. With the evidence stacked against him, the police charge Robert with the kidnapping and abuse of Lori Poland. His arrest marks the end of a harrowing chapter in Lori's life, but it's just the beginning of her journey towards healing. In August 1983, Robert Theoret pleads guilty to the abduction and assault of Lori. He also pleads guilty to one count of attempted murder. In exchange, however, as a result of a plea agreement, Robert is sentenced to only 10 years of imprisonment. The public is outraged by this outcome, but at least they can count on Robert staying behind bars for the full 10 years, right? In November 1988, after six years of imprisonment, the parole board considers Robert's application for parole. They swiftly grant it, as it was considered mandatory under the then existing laws. The public outcry is monumental. They want this monster to stay behind bars. Thankfully, a twist comes in the form of an oral opinion from an assistant attorney general. The opinion suggests that an individual sentenced for any sex offense is not subject to mandatory parole. Instead, such persons could be granted or denied parole at the parole board's discretion. A few months later, the parole board reverses its prior decision and votes to deny parole to Robert. 
Robert, believing that his parole was mandatory and he was entitled to immediate release, brings this action in district court seeking a writ of habeas corpus. A writ of habeas corpus is a legal action that a person can take if they believe they are being held in jail or in prison unfairly. It's essentially a request to a judge to order the person in charge of the jail or prison to bring the person to court so the judge can decide if their imprisonment is lawful or not. The district court denies the requested relief and Robert takes his case to the Supreme Court of Colorado. The Supreme Court of Colorado is tasked with interpreting the complex web of parole laws. They must determine whether Robert's parole is mandatory, as he argues, or discretionary, as the parole board contends. The court's decision is eagerly awaited. Will Robert be granted his freedom, or will he remain behind bars? The Supreme Court's decision is clear and decisive. They reverse the judgment of the district court, stating that Robert has accrued sufficient good time credits to require his discharge under the attempted first-degree murder charge. The parole board, they rule, may not decline to discharge him because he was concurrently sentenced for a sex offense. The Supreme Court's reasoning is based on a careful interpretation of the statutory provisions. The statute essentially states that a person convicted of a felony must be unconditionally released upon the expiration of their sentence, less any good time and earn time deductions. The Supreme Court decides that the mandatory parole provisions of the attempted murder charge should govern Robert's concurrent sentence. The reasoning is that that sentence was the longer of the two sentences. The court finds no bias to conclude that a person who had been concurrently sentenced for a sex offense loses his right to a mandatory parole on a longer, otherwise governing sentence. The Supreme Court decision is a complex interplay of statutory interpretation and legal reasoning where every word in a statute can have far-reaching implications. The courtroom's decision leads to public outrage, but the decision is final. The Colorado Supreme Court has spoken, and Robert Theoret is released on December 7, 1990. He remains out of the public light ever since. In time, Colorado's laws regarding sexual offenses would become harsher and more stringent with respect to parole and subsequent punishments, including registration, restricting where offenders could live, monitoring them in certain public spaces, and requiring mandatory sentence. So where is Lori Poland now? Lori, the survivor of a horrifying ordeal, has transformed her life into a beacon of hope and resilience. Today, she is the executive director of the National Foundation to End Child Abuse and Neglect, using her voice to educate and inspire those around her. In an interview, Lori shares her journey and her current work with a sense of passion and determination. She speaks about the importance of living in integrity and having hard conversations. She emphasizes that even though the topic of child abuse and neglect is difficult, it's crucial to bring awareness to the conversation. You know, at the end of the day, there's just like anything that's worthy of really talking about is not really something anybody wants to talk about. You know, like when we're talking about real life, we're talking about hard stuff and child abuse and neglect is just, a, is, is just another one of those hard things. And my hope at the end of the day is that we can truly bring joy to the topic. Lori also talks about how she has taken control of her own personal narrative. She mentions that she wakes up most days knowing that she has something great to live for. This sense of purpose is not because of her horrible experience, but rather this experience has informed why she does what she does and how she lives her life. And the reason I get up most days is because I know that I've got something great to live for. And that's not because I had this horrible experience, but this horrible experience certainly has informed why I do what I do and how I live my life and every relationship I have. And she is not just a survivor. She is a warrior who has taken her past and used it to fuel her future. Lori's story is a testament to the human spirit's ability to overcome adversity and use it as a catalyst for change. She is a living example of how one can turn a traumatic experience into a force for good. Lori's story is not just about survival, but about thriving and making a difference. She is a beacon of hope for others who have experienced trauma and a powerful advocate for ending child abuse and neglect. Her journey is a testament to the power of resilience, hope, and the human spirit. We 
we want to give a huge thank you to everyone over on Patreon. We want to give a big shout out to Nexus, Big Pepperoni Pizza, Chrissy R, Catherine D, Tony S, Tiffany D, and Doll Shay P. If you would like access to ad-free and uncensored versions of all Wicked videos, feel free to join our Patreon. Link in the description below. Thank you for watching and join us next time when we explore the psychological maze of some of the most wicked people.